This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 430, recorded on February 24th, 2017. This episode of TWIV is brought to you by Blue Apron. Blue Apron is the number one fresh ingredient and recipe delivery service in the country. See what's on the menu this week and get your first three meals free with your first purchase with free shipping by going to blueapron.com slash TWIV. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today here in an unseasonably warm New York City, Dixon, Pommier. Hello there, Vincent. Unseasonable, right? Very much so. It's uh, 23 Celsius here. It's May-like <laughs> outside. Can you see the sun? Oh, yeah. It's a partly cloudy, um, drifting slowly. Uh, yeah, it's very bright out. Now, last night I went outside, and I could smell the mold. Uh, All the spores are germinating. Wow. The gladiolus are popping up. Yep. Now, what's going to happen when it freezes again? Yeah, exactly right. Will or, it freeze or wait, is this it? What happens when it doesn't freeze over, you mean? Really? We'll, yeah, we'll blow our wad before May 1st, I can tell you No, that. it's not going to get cold again? Uh, it may not. Oh. Cold? What do you mean cold? You mean below zero? Well, this is February, and usually March is pretty cold. I know, yeah. We even get snow in March, right? Yeah, it's supposed to go down into the 40s next week. So maybe okay. a little bit of cold weather. but Also joining us from southeastern Michigan, Kathy Spindler. Hi, everybody. Hey, Kathy. It's 68 degrees mm. and severe thunderstorm warning. And just before we started recording, I told the guys it was about to start pouring with rain. And it is now doing that. Pouring. We're going to have heavy Eight. rain stopping in 40 minutes. Right. Isn't, it nice, isn't it nice being inside and... What, looking yeah. out at the heavy rain, right? Yeah. Well, if you cool. don't see any frontal clouds. So. As long as right. you're not outside. I also like hearing it on a roof or a yeah, roof. No, the rain roof. is very comforting, I think. It is? I think it is, yeah. Mm. Also joining us from Austin, Texas, Rich Condit. Hi, everybody. How are you doing? You sound mellifluous. Oh, I am <laughs> feeling mellifluous, whatever that was. <laughs> I didn't say it right either. Mellifluous. Uh, we got, uh, we got uh, what's that, Dixon? Mellifluous. Mellifluous. Okay. Uh, we've got uh, 79 degrees Fahrenheit, 26 Celsius, and a clear blue sky. It is a yeah. gorgeous day. Yeah. I don't even know if this, I think this is probably a little unseasonably warm. It was 90 here yesterday. Yeah, a little bit. Um, <laughs> You're but, into um, your first you know, I don't know what, I don't know what seasonable <laughs> is because I haven't been here for all the seasons yet and for enough time. But at any rate. I was out in uh, Madison last week and it was unseasonably warm. They told me this, there should have been a foot of snow on the ground, and there was nothing. Yeah. Well, you know, as we've already said, we're going to have to redefine what seasonable is. Or what normal is. Because that's, that's sure. changing. Yep. I can't imagine that we're not going to have freezing weather for the rest of this uh, month or two. Well, you know, usually it is. Um, but my wife said yesterday, are you ready to cut the grass? <laughs> sure, no problem. <laughs> I don't mind. Once a week, what, what could be bad about that, right? Yeah. Yeah, I can see the tulips, just or rather the daffodils, not the tulips. Are you tiptoeing through them? I'm trying. Who's that guy's name who sang? Tiny Tim. Tiny Tim. I saw him once in an airport. He was on my flight. Not really? Yeah, he looked just like he looked. <laughs> did he have his ukulele? He had right? his ukulele, yeah. Oh, my God. No kidding. Oh, my God. Yeah, that was a joke. He did. No he did, kidding. yeah. About that. Hmm. Uh, I am still waiting for the 27th emailer for the emerging infections book. What, what is this, December 27th? It has to be, <laughs> right? <laughs> Maybe it, maybe it was January. I mean, we're close, but we don't. People probably figure that it's over, so they don't bother. But that's well, kind of sad, I guess. As Yogi would say, now we're going to have a, we'll over. have a burst of uh, activity on Sunday, and then that'll be it. <laughs> it's a free book with free shipping, folks. Yeah. Okay, maybe if I offered them. A novel, they would want it, right? No, just lower the number, you know, make it the third third writer in or At something. At one point, I used a Twitter, and then people said, well, not all of us are on Twitter. And then I did a low number, and they said, well, not all of us are in the right time zone. So I'm too accommodating. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I push it up to 27, and well, uh, we have given a few books away. You know, I want to I empty my shelves here. That's the goal. 
Oh, well, good luck on that. Yeah, I know. It's going to take 10 years. Exactly. At which time you'll be gone, right, Dixon? It's possible. <laughs> uh, Ying- wow, if we're going to empty the, if we're going to empty shelves, I have a dog chewed up um, copy of Poo Poo and the Dragons that I could give away. <laughs> I wonder. <laughs> Listen, you could say second email, and nobody would would email. I'll bet. Right. <laughs> the option of rabies virus. There's some that- things that people don't want. Uh, Ying Fang and Susan Baker want you to know about Nito. No, Nido 2017, but it is a Nido meaning. <clears throat> the tw- 14th International Nido Virus Symposium, uh, June 4th through the 9th of this year in Kansas City. Uh, they have online registration. Early bird deadline is March 3rd, which is coming up. We'll put the link in the show notes. We'll be doing a TWIV from the meeting. Hmm. And this is an open international meeting as the meeting organizers recognize that the global community benefits from collaboration and sharing of ideas. Also, ASM, American Society for Microbiology, would like you to know about the Clinical Virology Symposium taking place May 7th through the 10th in a new location, Savannah, Georgia. That's a nice place. Very nice. Very nice. Lots of good food. This meeting is led by biomedical scientists who are engaged in research and primary care physicians and Laboratorians involved with patient care. That's what it says, folks. <laughs> it's a leading event covering key viral infection topics. You can submit an abstract and case study by March 1st. So we got another deadline coming up. If you register before March 30th, you'll get early bird savings. You can go to asm.org slash CVS. Yeah, it's an unfortunate URL. <laughs> kind of like a drugstore. I was going to say, but uh, I didn't. Kathy, you have anything to tell us? We'd like to have a couple of people maybe write a blog post about how to get the most out of an ASV meeting. And so we're thinking maybe from a student or postdoc perspective and maybe from a faculty perspective. And to get this going, I thought it would be good if we would just solicit your first paragraph of such a blog post and maybe have a deadline of March 8th. And you could email it to TWIV and Vincent will forward it to us. Or if you can find my email address, you can email me. Um, And then because we have a couple of points that we want to make sure that people get from one blog post or the other. Some of this is based on the survey that we did last year of people who attended the meeting. And a lot of things came up where people didn't know how to download the full PDF of the program or Mm -hmm. how to deal with the fact that there's two things going on at the same time and things like that. So we wanted to maybe provide some strategies for people who are attending for the first time or even people who've attended for a while just to see how other people do it. So write your first paragraph of a blog post about how to get the most out of an ASV meeting, email it to us by March 8th, and then we'll get back to you about uh, maybe writing the whole blog post. And you're going to have one person you're going to pick, right? One or two, as I said, you know, maybe a trainee uh, and then a faculty member. Or, you okay. know, if we get two very different ones yeah. from trainees, we can we can do that too. We'll just see what we get. And uh, the, I think the winners, we should give some uh, TWIV swag. Okay. So, Sounds good. You know, your two winners, we can have them pick some one item from the TWIV catalog over at Cafe Press. Cool. And when they when that happens, we'll send them the link. Okay. Yep. You can get Good. a mug. Okay. You can get a cooler. You can get a shirt. You, you got some shirts, right, Dixon? I got some sweatshirts. You wear them? I do. You can get mouse right. pads. They're fantastic. Can, I have a mouse pad. Yeah, you can get all kinds of things. A yeah, cup of mouse pad on a sweatshirt. Twiv, Twip, Twim, Twivo in Urban Ag. Right? You've got a wall, right? I do. Good. Thank you very much. We have some follow-up here. Richard writes, Dear Twix Cabal, thank you very much for your hard work in producing the Twix family of podcasts, which includes urban agriculture. <laughs> does it, Dixon? It still does. Yes, of course it does. People are still writing in about it. They, they still like it. So why don't we do some? I've been trying. Not hard enough. It's, it's hey, well, how about we do a paper? Do they have any papers in the field? <laughs> no, they don't, actually. This is this is... This is it's an interesting um, turn of events, to be honest. Uh, a lot of them have established, and they don't let people in because well, that's you, true. Yeah, 
U.S. FDA says that uh, you'll contaminate them with things. Anyway, continuing with Richard's yes. email. I especially Sorry. enjoyed TWIV 428 featuring the paper about astrocytes by Daniels et al. However, when Vincent read the title of the paper, he spoke so quickly that it was nigh impossible <laughs> to interpret the terminology. This matters to me. When the title of a paper is read, mm-hmm. I believe that the neural structures associated with my memory of the terms are primed for use and modification. For this reason, reading the title at normal speed may help me subconsciously prepare for the material that is to follow. If anything, a very brief silence after reading the title would help me understand the material better. As a non-scientist, I frequently listen at or a little beyond the limit of my ability, and I sometimes repeat portions of a podcast several times before I can understand This is by no means a complaint. It is specifically because your podcasts are not watered down much that makes them informative, interesting, and valuable. Please keep challenging me with the undiluted truth made more manageable by your warm camaraderie and spiced with an amusing modicum of needling. (laughs) What a lovely sentence that is. I like that. I like that. (laughs) Uh, I do more than needle you, Dixon, don't I? That's okay. It's a sunny... Yeah, that's uh, that's putting it it (laughs) mild. I've got a thick skin. (laughs) It's a sunny 52F in Chicago, vaguely unnerving for mid-February. Yeah, vaguely. They say the trees need cold snaps to control arthropod pests. That's true. So I hope it was cold enough for them this winter. Mm. The gravity wave amplitude here in Chicago is undetectable at this time, (laughs) but we can say it is below 1.2 times 10 to the minus 21st, last measured by LIGO on September 14th, 2015. Cheers, Richard R.N. Now, I read that quickly because it was, it was a complicated title, if I remember, and I just wanted it to be funny. That was TWIV 428, right? Yeah. So it was, here's the title. Regional astrocyte interferon signaling restricts pathogenesis during neurotropic viral infection. All right, I'll, I'll read them slower. <laughs> no problem. In fact, I'm ready to read one right now. We have a snippet for you, which um, just came out recently. In Cell Reports, it's from... Investigators at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, uh, both in Fort Collins, Colorado, and in uh, Atlanta, Georgia, and also at Colorado State in Fort Collins, which is a lovely town. I would I would move there were it not so flat. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to go far to find mountains there, though. <laughs> I know, I'm just kidding. Frequent Zika virus, sexual transmission, and prolonged viral RNA shedding in an immunodeficient mouse model. Hmm. That's very straightforward. The authors are Nisha Dugal. Is that how you say it? Dugal? Actually, you know, I didn't check. I would have just said it Dugal. Dugal? I don't know. Yana Dugal. Dugal. Yana Ritter, Pastorius, Zaki, Davis. Chang, Bowen, and the last author is Aaron Brault. And um, <clears throat> this is a very interesting paper where they take mice and ask, can Zika virus be sexually transmitted? Because, all right, now here, the CDC line is that there are several cases of male-to-male uh, transmission of Zika virus, a case of male-to-male, and a suspected case of female-to-male. And we have uh, You misspoke there. Several cases of male-to-female. What did I a say? A single case of, you said male to male. A single case of male to male, is that right? Yeah. And one suspected case of female to male. I'm blaming Trump. Right? <laughs> I, I, you know, I think that's entirely. Anyway, we, we've, we've um, <clears throat> discussed a bit here how they're suspected, not confirmed in my opinion, but you can have your own opinion. That's fine. Anyways, they want to have a mouse, an animal model to check it. And that's great. I think that's wonderful. I was in, when I did my uh, TWIV last week, they have a non-human primate model of Zika virus. And I asked them, are they going to do uh, sexual transmission studies? And they said, and this was very interesting, I thought. They couldn't control the dose. Of course you can't, but <laughs> you, can That's you, not the you point. can't do it in people either, so? right? That's not the point. <laughs> anyway, in here they have I, a mouse. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, you want a, you want a quantita- qualitative answer. Yeah. That's exactly. It's not. not it's, it's, it's different. Oh well. Call him back up. <laughs> well, you know, he said um, that's very difficult to do, and I said that they don't have sex. He said, "No, uh, they do, but you can't <laughs> control the dose." These are um, rhesus macaques, I believe. Anyway, here they use mice, and and we've talked about mouse models of Zika before. Uh, they use the AG one two nine mice, which uh, lack 
uh, interferon alpha, beta, and gamma genes, and that's why they can be infected and develop. They die basically. And if you use wild type mice, they don't die. They just they make a little viremia and goodbye. So they infect males, and then they mate them with normal female mice that aren't defective in uh, the CD1 mice. And um, they, they, they infect the males uh, intraperitoneally. And they uh, immediately, within a couple of days, they see virus in the serum. Uh, they find virus in the testes, epididymis, and seminal vesicles by three days post-inoculation. They find virus... Uh, in spermatogenic precursors, epididymal, epithelia, luminal cell debris, and sometimes in inflammatory cells. So this is not new. We know that the virus in mice goes and replicates uh, in uh, testicular tissues. Uh, and then they mate them with the female mice. They collect seminal fluids from the females, and they find virus uh, in the seminal fluids. Now, what I found really interesting and what I blogged about last week, and I... I think this is terrific. The, the authors look for, for a viral, the assay virus by both PCR and plaque assay. Infectious viral titers um, were detected between day 7 and day 21 uh, in semen, and RNA lasted until day 58. I think this is fabulous because in all fields, people look for Ebola persistence and Zika, et cetera, and they do PCR, and they say, oh, infectious virus out to day 3,472, <laughs> and they never look for virus. And this shows you that sometimes you can have RNA for a long time without infectious virus. Now, there is a lower limit, of course, of a plaque assay, but it's it's pretty low, and um, I don't know why there's non-infectious RNA shed for so long. It's an interesting question, <laughs> but I think it, it just goes, Dixon, here's the story. Here's the, the bottom line. RNA is not infectious virus. That's exactly right. So it's one, of, one of the important quantifications they do on this, uh, important to me anyway, is mm. that they uh, show a ratio of RNA to plaque assay because the RNA, the amount of RNA does sort of decline with time yeah. in semen. Yeah. And you could say, well, okay, things are declining to the point where uh, you're getting below the limits of detection in the plaque assay. But that apparently is not so because – uh, they've got this nice little graph of the ratio of RNA to uh, plaque assay. And what you see is that af after a certain amount of time, the ratio of RNA to uh, uh, plaque assay uh, increases, mm -hmm. implying that there really is RNA around, more RNA than than plaques. Yep. Okay, so you're, right. you're looking at RNA that is not associated with this infectious virus. I mean, the key thing here is epidemiologically, you know, if, if a human sheds for 100 days, but it's not infectious virus. What, you know, what's the significance of that? So I, I think everyone needs to remember when you look at these. I think it's fine for diagnostics for routine diagnostics. Obviously, PCR is fine. But when you're doing these new studies where you have a new agent, you you don't know you didn't know before that right. it persisted. You have to make sure you're looking at infectious virus. Otherwise, you don't know what it means. During the Ebola outbreak, did they check that also? For no, the same they, thing? they mostly did PCR because it's very difficult to do in plaque assays for Ebola. Okay. You have to be in a BSL-4 facility, right? right. And, but that's not an excuse. I asked the, the people at the, mm -hmm. my, my Zika mm -hmm. TWIV last week, why don't you do more plaque assays? Because <laughs> they do mostly PCR to assay. Maybe they don't have a wall like that. No, he said it's too much work. <laughs> too much work? Well, he didn't say that. He said we have a lot of samples, but it, the implicit thing is that we it's, it's too much. But I think that's not a good excuse. You should not let whether something is hard or not dictate whether you do it. Now, I know I'm preaching. I'm sorry. It's all right. Let me go on. So they also... But uh, before you do, I just yeah. wanted to say that uh, that finding about the RNA mm. to plaque forming unit ratio changing over time is true for two different age groups of mice. So in this paper, they use 18-week-old mice and 13-week-old mice. So the light gray circles are the 13-week-old mice and the dark gray yeah. are the 18-week-old mice. Yep. And this is an open access paper, so everybody can look at this if they want. So they should do the same thing in people. If they're going to look for PCR, they should do some plaque assays. Not that hard. In fact, you know what? Send me the samples. We'll do <laughs> they also use um, vasectomized males. Uh -huh. And the seminal fluids have much lower titers, uh, but they have similar levels of RNA. 
compared to there you go that that, yeah and that that (laughs) suggests to me that that rna is coming from somewhere else right Mm -hmm. absolutely yeah they say prolonged shedding in semen may not be derived from the same source as infectious virus so the virus source seems to go off after 21 days up to 21 days and then there's some other source that is not infectious anyway then they mate these um uh, mice with uh, females, and they get about 50% uh, transmission to uh, females in terms of infection. And in this case, they're using the AG129 Zika susceptible mm, right. females as opposed to when they were using the CD1s, that was merely to be able to collect right. the seminal right. fluid and assay it. And so it didn't matter that they weren't susceptible. Exactly, exactly. Uh, two of the seven pregnant females had evidence of fetal demise. They got virus from the uterus of uh, 10 of 13 infected mice. They got transmission in two of 11 fetuses. Um, also, the vasectomized males were able to transmit as well, as you might guess, because they are shedding infectious virus up to a certain point. But at a lower frequency. Lower frequency, yeah. They also checked for female-to-male sexual transmission. Did not see that any evidence for that uh, in this experiment Mm -hmm. so i think this is a good this tells me that you can transmit virus uh, through semen in a mouse which suggests that it could happen also in people Um, now they use um, they use immunocompromised animals and so the you know the high the frequency here is pretty high so what it would be in people i don't know it is very rare of course as far as we can tell. All right. So I was listening to uh, I was listening to the podcast from last week when you we were talking about uh, this stuff in uh, the macaques, and you were talking mm. about uh, plaque assays and some of the difficulties associated with that. Whether you use, I think it was in that podcast, or maybe I encountered it somewhere else. But whether you use serum or oh, yeah. right. um, or just blood. Uh, and uh, the notion that you know, the efficiency of the plaque assay may differ depending on what you're using. And if I were doing this stuff, uh, I would have as a routine uh, some mixing experiments mm-hmm. where I uh, took you know, serum and mixed it with a known quantity of virus to find out whether there's inhibitors in there that are screwing up my plaque assay. Get a, get an idea of whether whether you're getting an accurate count in the plaque assay. Of course, it's a little difficult because, in fact, I suppose what you really want is serum from an infected animal as a control yeah. because there could be inhibitors in there, and that that is problematic. Nevertheless, um, uh, I think s- some experiments to try and figure out whether your plaque assay is giving you the right numbers or not are Mm -hmm. appropriate. One last thing I want to point out, they say in their discussion, non-sexual transmission of Zika virus is unlikely to explain the infection of mated females in this study. However, we cannot rule out a non-sexual method of male-to-female transmission. That seems... Bit. Maybe they were heavily kissing. <laughs> no, I think they were told to put that in. I'm not sure why. Not, but, well, not they, by me. Yeah, and, and and they they point out in making that statement that they had uh, infected and uninfected animals running around in the same cage during the course of the experiment. And they yeah. didn't see anything that looked like transmission between them. Yep. Among them. Now, they also say, um, they also suggest that horizontal transmission between non-human primates may be a secondary me- mechanism of Zika maintenance during periods when the vectors are not hmm. abundant. Reminds me of some experiments that were done early on in the West Nile virus outbreaks when they wondered how colonies of crows that apparently were in mosquito-free regions were still becoming infected. And hmm. they, they put a whole bunch of crows together and they threw one infected crow in there. Lo and behold, two weeks later, they were all dead. Were they counting crows? They were counting crows. I, we should do it a, an it was, episode so we can call it that. It was actually a murder of crows. <laughs> mur- now, what is a murder? How many crows? Murder of crows, I think, is more than like six or eight or something That's like this. Yeah, but this was, that one. The investigator was the murderer of crows. Got it. Now, how did that one crow transmit to all the others? That's what they wanted to know. And it was they probably through nasal secretions. Oh. Yeah, but it's possible. Can you make a crow sound? Nice. Good, Dixon. That's good. I like that. You know, I 
I think bird sounds are interesting. Some of them are really unusual. They're true. They're not, all, they're not all very pleasant. They're like chittery, chattery things. Oh, that's things, right. You know? That's right. That's right. Especially when I walk my dogs, the birds tend to make noise. I had a good friend who I used to fish with who could do all the good bird calls for the common ones. And, uh, you know, they'd call back. I think they're so cool. Ah. The one I liked the best, though, was the Bob White. What's that? <laughs> Bob White? <laughs> <laughs> I saw a cute joke the other day in the New Yorker. It was the New Yorker. There are two eagles sitting on a branch, and one is saying, the next time I fly, I'm going to call myself a Canadian eagle. <laughs> I want to tell you a little about Nisha. Nisha was an undergraduate at U of M, and after she graduated, She's this she the worked- first author? Yes. Nisha Dougal, okay. or Dougal, or Dougal, or whatever. Sorry, Nisha. Uh, she worked as a technician in Alice Telsnitsky's lab for two years. And I remember seeing her in the hallway quite a bit, and I interviewed her for the graduate program here. But she went to University of Washington for her PhD at the same time as my undergrad, Ephraim Lim, of Baby's First Virome fame, those of you that remember that twiv. And they were both in uh, Mike Emmerman's lab. Mm, And so I contacted her, asked her a few questions about the paper and about her background, And first, uh, the paper, I asked her why they did IP inoculations, and she said that's because it's their usual method of inoculating West Nile virus in mice, and there weren't any Zika virus animal models published at the time they started, and they're considering switching to subcutaneous in the future. Just how the mosquito does it. Yeah. And um, her main study at the CDC there in Fort Collins is West Nile virus and St. Louis encephalitis virus evolution and the impact on avian pathogenesis. Nice. But uh, when Zika came along, she also started studying the sexual transmission. And they're working on a prospective study now of male traver- travelers infected with Zika. And they're measuring Zika shedding in semen, uh, currently using RT-PCR, which was the reason for doing the RT-PCR in the mouse model. Mm-hmm. She doesn't mention whether they're measuring uh, by plaque assay as well. Anyway, she said that... Um, she really likes working for Aaron Brault because he still works in the lab and helps with the animal work. And Dick Bowen performed the mouse vasectomies, which were quite impressive to watch. Mm. So, uh, as I said, she uh, in Mike Emmerman's lab, she also uh, uh, worked with Harmit Malik. And so she worked on evolution and genetic conflict. And she received a fellowship for uh, a postdoc at the CDC and uh, – joined Aaron's lab. So she applied for this kind of postdoc uh, fellowship called Association of Public Health Laboratories. And after she got it, then there was a long list of labs that she could consider going to. So that's how that worked out. But she thinks that postdoc funding mechanism doesn't, uh, has dried up. Um, And she's on the job market now. And I think that's most of it. Uh, She's a TWIV fan and she will be in Madison. So I told her to come find us. And, well, we'll get to uh, meet her then, because I'll be there too. Exactly. If you go, I'll go. All right. Thank yeah. you. Oh, yeah. Thank you, Kathy. Yep. Sponsor of this episode is Blue Apron. Blue Apron's mission is to make incredible home cooking accessible to everyone, while supporting a more sustainable food system, setting high standards for ingredients, and building a community of home chefs. What they do is deliver seasonal recipes along with fresh, high-quality ingredients, so you can make great home-cooked meals. Every meal comes with a step-by-step recipe card and pre-measured ingredients, everything but salt, pepper, and oil. You can make your meal in 40 minutes or less, and it'll cost you less than $10 a person. It's really good, and I've done this, and it's very, very, very good. Delicious. I have now done it, too. You have? How was it? It was great. I I did. You had barramundi, right? I did seared chicken and pan sauce. Nice. I did cumin-crusted pork. (laughs) <laughs> and I did crispy barramundi. Did you? And did uh, they you, were uh, they were all they were all quite good and uh, and and really different, you know. Yeah. So they're very creative. Did you do it yourself? Yeah, yeah. Because I know when I visited you, you were cooking. I filmed you yeah. cooking actually. Right. I know some right. people that would have to order two meals of the same thing in order to make sure that they got it right because they'd probably really? burn the first one. <laughs> yeah. Talk about me? No, no, not you. No, oh, not my. you. No, lab scientists wouldn't have any problem with this, but I think people that uh, have no experience like that would. Uh, well, it, it, this sort of, among other things, feeds my sort of tidy or OCD <laughs> behavior because <laughs> you know one of the one of the things that I uh, one of the things that I learned uh, in the lab is um, first time through, 
you're following a new protocol, mm. follow the protocol. That's right. Okay. That's do right. what they say to do, <laughs> even if you're tempted to do something here, here. different. Okay. As, as so many people, they get a protocol and they just change everything first yep. time around. Okay. Yep. And so you got no baseline. You don't, you don't know what it's supposed to be like. And so these recipes are actually very well designed. And I go through and I get a big thrill <laughs> out of following the protocol right. <laughs> and see how it comes out. Yeah. It's good. That's yeah. the uh, appeal to scientists of cooking, there you go. I guess, following the yeah, protocol. Fun. Right. And uh, that's why I think this is a good match for some of our listeners. Actually, many of them. Anyone who is rushed and doesn't have a lot of time to shop, this is the cool thing. You don't have to go out and buy everything. Right. That's what I like. It comes in a box and it's all ready to go. Yep. What I really like is it's imaginative. Okay. I, yeah. You know, I, I, there's no way I would cook anything like this without <laughs> somebody uh, dropping it on my doorstep and saying, here, yeah. do this. <laughs> <laughs> They have uh, a community of farms, fisheries, and ranches across the U.S., and that's where they get their material, over 150. Lovely. And they they source everything very responsibly and sustainably, like their fish is done under standards developed with the Monterey Bay Aquarium Seafood Watch. They get their meats from responsibly raised animals, produce from farms that practice regenerative farming, and they they give you enough for the recipe and no more, so there's no waste. And in fact, you can't overeat either unless you make a meal for two and eat the whole thing, I guess. You could do that. <laughs> you can customize your recipes, get it whenever you want. There's no uh, obligation or commitment. They deliver to 99% of the U.S., and they change the recipes. So in one year, you're not going to get the same one twice in any couple of weeks. For example, as uh, Rich Condit said, he had crispy barramundi with quinoa and roasted carrot salad. There's also roasted pork with apple, walnut, and farro salad, and udon noodle soup with miso and soft-boiled eggs. Mm. Very imaginative stuff. As Rich said, I wouldn't do it. But then again, I'm not a cook. I'm not a chef. I'm a consumer, not a creator. <laughs> Check out this week's menu and get three meals free with your first purchase with free shipping by going to blueapron.com slash twiv. It's blueapron.com slash twiv. You will love how good it feels and tastes to create incredible home-cooked meals with Blue Apron. So don't wait. Blue Apron, a better way to cook. You know, I just started seeing their ads on TV, yep. too. Yep. I look at them, and I thought, Twiv. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> of course. Uh, if we had a Twiv ad, boy, <laughs> on TV. That's right. Wow. That would be something. Well. One day, maybe. One I don't know. They'll, they'll listen and go, why do I have to listen to an hour and a half of these people? <laughs> All right, we have another uh, Cell Report article, two in a row here for our main article. And this one is Immune Escape via a Transient Gene Expression Program Enables Productive Replication of a Latent Pathogen. The first author is Jessica Linderman. And the, and other, the co-author is there's a co -author. Mariko, yeah, Mariko Kobayashi, oh, yeah. so co-first authors. Oh, God. Mm -hmm. I have to Another thing I have to look at in the paper. Okay. And the second, the next, the, the remainders are Ryanavar, Fack, Darnell, Robert Darnell, James Darnell's son, Moses Chow, who I know, Angus Wilson, who I know, and Ian Moore, whom I also know. I also know Mariko as well. I've met her there. Now, um, I asked Ian if he would come up here and sit with us. He's, he's on his way to California, so he couldn't do that. And then I asked Angus. And he's teaching, and that's it. That's the extent of my, <laughs> my efforts. Oh, well. Um, but this is about herpes simplex virus and the regulation of latency, emergence from latency. That's a very interesting question. Herpes viruses infect you, and they infect mucosal surfaces. You get this very early in life, typically from your parents. You get a mucosal infection. You may or may not have a... Uh, a cold sore associated with that. Um, and then the virus enters peripheral ganglia where the genome is then silenced and exists in neurons for the rest of your life. As Sol Silverstein used to say, like, unlike love, herpes is forever. He probably got that from someone else, right? True love. He meant true love. I don't know what he meant. The difference between true love and herpes virus is that herpes lasts Well, forever. that's not the way he said it. No. Unlike, her, unlike love, herpes like is forever. That's In fact, right. he used to show the medical students that slide. 
Right. And then periodically, the genome, which is present as a closed circular episomal DNA, you know what that means? Double, double strand, yeah, double, double stranded, stranded DNA. DNA. <laughs> it's silenced. It's highly. It's it's chromatinized. It's associated with nucleosomes. And it's silent. It just makes a, a small transcript called the lat latency-associated transcript. And uh, no viral proteins are made. Made it's silent. And then periodically it reactivates. Typically upon stress. Right. UV light or an exam. Right. <laughs> or TWIV. <laughs> exactly. When you haven't read the paper and you're desperate for the uh, bottom line. Is that how you get? <laughs> Sometimes. And so then, then the, the genome uh, replicates, makes infectious virus, which uh, then travels down the nerve. And, and if this is uh, uh, originally in a trigeminal ganglia, it would go to your lip. Yes. And then you would have a fever sore. Then you would pass it to someone else, like your children or, or someone else. Exactly. So it's a good strategy for sticking around and, and transmitting to new hosts. Of course, if it didn't reactivate, it wouldn't be much of a exactly. virus. Would it? Right. it would just be with you for the rest of your life. Yes. And the vast majority of infections are uh, asymptomatic, so yeah. we're talking about uh, over 90% of the adult population harbors this virus in a latent state, uh, and it's probably doing this kind of stuff all the time, but you never know it because there's, yeah. there's no symptoms. Right. And uh, this, is a char- this whole latency thing is a characteristic of the whole herpes virus family. There's HSV type 2, which is, causes uh, genital sores, very closely related in all respects to HSV type 1. And then there's Epstein-Barr virus that uh, is the clinical syndrome, syndromes are associated with uh, mononucleosis and, um, oh man, Burkitt's what's the lymphoma. tumor? Burkitt's Burkitt's lymphoma. lymphoma, that's right. Yeah. And, uh, and several other uh, cancers. And uh, then there's uh, chicken pox, varicella zoster. Yep. Same kind of deal. So this is an important problem. Indeed. Now the in the latent state, we we um, actually did a paper on a previous TWIV. It was at three sixty nine. Now that the the herpes genome is silenced by in part by regulation of the chromatin, in particular by methylation of histones, specific histones on specific residues that keeps the chromatin from being transcribed. And we in our paper that we did on TWIV three sixty nine. It's a very interesting finding where stress actually induces phosphorylation of a neighboring histone, and that overrides the methylation without removing it. Because normally, you know, these methylations are taken off, and that turns on chromatin, but that's not the case here. So it's a phosphorylation at a neighboring histone that huh. then reactivates. So what happens in reactivation uh, is you get this phosphorylation, and but then the program of transcription is very different from when a virus is coming in, when a virus comes in, when herpes virus comes into cells, it brings in a protein in the virus particle called VP16, which goes in the nucleus, allows activation of transcription of the early, immediate early genes, and then the early genes are made, and then the late genes are made in a very regulated cascade. The late genes include structural genes. Make them late because you haven't replicated DNA yet. There's no point in making them early. In this case, in the neuron, if phosphorylation of uh, these histones occur, you get a burst of transcription, which they call phase one, or I think they call it animation or animated, something like that. Yeah. And I don't know why they call it that, but yeah, I found that a it's interesting. Odd. And you get all the genes, immediate, early, early, and late. There's no temporal, boom, all of them at once. Very interesting. And then if conditions are right, and that's what this paper is about, you go into phase two in which you get uh, DNA replication and the production of infectious virus. Okay, mm-hmm. and so again, it's some kind of stress that that triggers this phosphorylation. We we, we talked about it in that previous TWIV, and and uh, we'll get so back to it none later. of the phase one proteins are included into the final virus. You know, you don't get They're just to, in, in 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 they enable the second phase to occur. Well, That's, you get transcription, but no protein or DNA synthesis right. in this first phase. Okay, okay. So these are just helper proteins for the second phase to come along is that it well, some of them are yeah but the late all right <laughs> the late ones are made early too but not the proteins no, just the mrna sure 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 all right but phase so one I, the I, point is there's no virus production in right, phase one right yeah uh i uh well actually i had a uh conversation with dave bloom this morning because i wanted to he's my go-to yep herpes <laughs> person um and um uh i want to 
point out that this paper, as we'll get into, is a is done is all done in cell culture, mm-hmm. um, and uh, you know herpes latency is really difficult to <laughs> uh, to study, uh, and there are several different animal models. It's a human virus, right? But there's uh, several different animal models, none of them perfect, and there are a few culture models, none of them perfect. My understanding, and since I talked to Dave, um, if I get this wrong, I'll blame him. Uh, <laughs> but the authors can write in and uh, correct us. But my understanding is that this phase one, phase two thing has only been observed in this culture model. Mm-hmm. Yeah, in okay? fact, Angus, Angus uh, oh. Graham is one of the nice. people who has found that, right? One of the authors on this paper, right? Right. And so, so that doesn't mean it's wrong, okay? But uh, that I, to me, that's a caveat. Mm-hmm. Right, uh, I I uh, would be nice to ultimately see some some uh, experiments that supported the notion that the phase one, phase two thing took place uh, in animals. And the other thing is that um, my understanding is that during phase one, you may actually make a little bit of virus because they talk about. Uh, the need for uh, some of the tegument proteins. These are proteins that are encapsidated, including VP16, in order to initiate phase two. And the implication is that, in fact, you make a little virus and that stuff gets out of the phase one program cells and infects some surrounding cells. And they could either be uh, naive or they could actually harbor latent genomes. Mm-hmm. And that initiates phase two. That's my Okay. Because here in this it. paper it says, Phase one proceeds without infectious virus production. Oh, it does. Okay, fine. I, I missed that. And then they say phase two depends on VP16 so that you can right. activate all the, the other right. transcripts. And that's a tagument protein, yes. but that does, it doesn't necessarily, wouldn't necessarily have to be How patched. many genes okay, are fine. we talking about here? Uh, herpes has about 80, 90 genes. And how many like of the big, ones are transcribed genome. in for phase one? Uh, in phase one? Yeah. Everything. All in this them? phase, phase one, everything, yeah. I mean, everything. All 80 genes are activated in phase one, and then in phase two? I don't know if it's all. Phase two, then you have production of protein and DNA replication and infectious virus part. I'm missing. So so the normal the normal acute This is uh, in reactivation, program. Dixon. I understand. Right. I understand. Okay. The, in an acute infection, okay, the initial infection, when you get your mucosa uh, infected yeah. and the virus goes through yeah. what we call a lytic infection, there's a cascade of gene expression. Okay. It's uh, okay. immediate early genes followed by early genes followed by late genes. The immediate early genes, there's only about five of them. Uh, and the early genes uh, is another larger handful. Uh, I don't know, maybe a dozen or so. Um, and that includes all the genes for, genes for DNA replication, et cetera. And the late genes... Uh, are a larger uh, fraction of the genome, and that includes all of the things that go into making the capsid and packaged in the tegument, and, and et cetera. Right. Um, exactly. So, so the 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 program would start with just a few genes in phase two, and then turn on others. But this uh, this phase one, they say everything gets transcribed. You know, it it kind of makes sense to me. You know, that it wouldn't necessarily go through a program that mm-hmm. it's just as, as far as the cells are concerned, it's just a piece of DNA, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah. And, and something's going on that enables all of a sudden, oh, okay, we're going to transcribe this thing. Yeah, it's it not will, a virus at that point. As soon as those histones are phosphorylated, you can, you can turn on the transcription of the, right. the genome. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. So the main thing between phase one and phase two with respect to transcription of uh, Apparently, is that in phase two, there's a second wave of VP-dependent viral transcription. So it may be that there's more or that maybe there's qualitatively some different Could be. transcription yeah. in phase two. Sure. So if you have all the pieces of the puzzle in phase one, but it doesn't come together. No proteins. There are no proteins made in phase one, just transcripts. I see your point. All right, no take DNA replication. Right? Take it all. No you, DNA replication. You can't make okay, okay. Virus. I'm clear now. Claro. All right. Yep. Now, then the other part of this picture is the interferon system. Right. All right. So besides this epigenetic silencing of the genome, it's quite clear that interferons affect latency as well. All right. Now, some interferons, type 1, alpha, beta, infect the spread at the initial infection, and they can restrict replication. 
Um, but other, type two gamma interferon seems to help control reactivation. Not so much, not so much important for the initial infection, but seems to be controlling uh, reactivation. Now, and the idea here is that uh, the sources of interferon is not the neurons themselves, but some other source, some extrinsic source, because neurons reportedly lack an intrinsic response to virus, an intrinsic interferon response. So things like CD8 T cells may be making interferon gamma and so forth. So just keep that in mind. In fact, this is what this paper is about, how interferons influence the gene expression program during reactivation, right? Phase one, phase two. That's what they want to know in this paper. And they use a primary neuronal culture model, neurons derived from rats, that they can infect with virus and they can establish a latent infection and they can reactivate from that latency. And they can say what's going on with interferons. They want to know what's the impact of exogenous interferons. So they have a, rep- in their first set of experiments, they have a herpes simplex virus with a GFP gene in the genome so they can measure GFP. It's fused to a, ra- a late promoter. So you can see that firing whenever the late promoter is firing. So they can infect these neuronal cultures, uh, and they infect, uh, and they, they establish latency. They do so in the presence of acyclovir, which I, I presume that's a DNA synthesis inhibitor. Yeah, so I wanted to detail this uh, system a little bit. Go ahead. They're, ta- they ta- they're taking superior cervical ganglia from rats, mm-hmm. okay? And I presume one of the reasons for that is that they're big and they're easy to get at. Mm-hmm. Uh, both the rats and those uh, ganglia, and there there may be uh, <laughs> issues with uh, culturing them as well. And they they do a couple of manipulations, including some filtering and et cetera, to get uh, to enrich for uh, the neurons. And then they uh, plate those in culture, and they initially culture them with appropriate uh, uh, neuron friendly uh, media, um, and. Uh, what, a fitocolon and 5-fluorouracil. A fitocolon is a transcription inhibitor, inhibitor and 5-fluorouracil is a messes up DNA replication. And the idea there is to get rid of replicated <coughs> cells, uh, which would have mm-hmm. the effect of enriching for neurons. Mm-hmm. Uh, and once those cultures are established, as you said, they um, infect in the presence of acyclovir. Acyclovir is a specific inhibitor of herpes virus uh, DNA replication. And if they don't do that, my understanding is the virus just goes in and goes through an acute infection mm-hmm. and destroys the culture and you're, you're you know, game over. So these, uh, which, this is but, a maintenance culture. Right? This is not a dividing cell culture. Yes, right. it's a maintenance culture. And it's an expert. So, if you, yep. so they infect at a high multiplicity. So right. uh, hopefully all or many, most of the majority of the neurons are infected. They do it in the presence of acyclovir to right. um, suppress any lytic replication. And they keep that for a, a period of time. I forget. It's a matter of days. Um, and then... Uh, when they want to do the experiments, they withdraw the acyclovir right. and do whatever they're going to do. Mm-hmm. Uh, and importantly, as you'll see in the figures, uh, under those circumstances, when you withdraw the a- acyclovir, they get a certain amount of um, background spontaneous reactivation. And it's pretty high. They get on the order of uh, 20% of the cultures that are um, spontaneously reactivating. But uh, there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, 80% of them are not immediately mm-hmm. spontaneously reactivating and maintain a latent state for a period of time. Um, so we're talking about rats. We're talking about uh, sympathetic neurons where ordinarily you uh, infect uh, this these viruses uh, home to sensory neurons. Uh, we're talking about doing this in the presence of acyclovir. So it's a model. It's not perfect, but it's a good model. Um, and probably one of the best out there, and they've characterized it very, very well. These are these are tough, tough experiments. Right, great. So, what they in fact they establish latency. They don't see any green fluorescence, and then they stimulate reactivation using an, a protein kinase inhibitor. Okay, and this is called LY. Let's let's call it LY. It's an inhibitor of PI three kinase. Now, why this reactivates is because PI3 kinase is a is part of a signaling cascade that leads to the phosphorylation of a protein called 4-EBP1. When 4-EBP1 is phosphorylated, protein synthesis proceeds, 
and presumably the protein synthesis is needed to keep the genomes in their latent state because if you release, if you inhibit protein synthesis using an inhibitor of the kinase, which allows, uh, which defor- uh, dephosphorylates 4-EBP1 and then protein synthesis is inhibited, then you get reactivation. All right. And that same pathway, they are they are maintaining stimulated uh, when they're trying to maintain latency because they've got that pathway is stimulated by nerve growth factor, which right. they have That's right. in the media. You want to keep uh, protein uh, synthesis going, right? And so one of the reasons, these, one of these reasons that these papers are so hard to read <laughs> is that <laughs> um, the uh, nerve growth factor. Um, uh, stimulates production of an inhibitor. Uh, I can't even do it. You're talking about inhibitors of inhibitors of inhibitors yeah, yeah, that yeah. activate mm-hmm. something, and you got to keep all that straight. And it's just really a mind boggling. Yeah, I mean, leave- yeah. It- I went to one of the review articles, or actually, it's a primary paper, but they have a figure in it that, uh, that, and I actually had written in my figure exactly the opposite of what you said, Vincent. I thought that the <laughs> phosphorylated the Sorry. phosphorylated for EBP blocks protein synthesis. So I yeah, it's tough. Yeah, phosphorylated so four E B P normally binds the cap binding protein four E, which is required for protein synthesis. In its phosphorylated right. form, it will not bind uh four E and and protein synthesis will proceed. Right. And I stuck the, in a figure for that uh, in the four E B P is a repressor. Of translation, okay. that's right. When it's okay. phosphorylated, you, when it's phosphorylated, no. it's it's not a repressor. No, uh, ordinarily okay. it's a repressor. The phosphorylation inactivates yeah. it, so that's it right. no longer represses. This that's what like I miss. Okay, confusing. I mean the, the, the you're inhibiting line. a repressor, right? Yes, yeah. right. And then you're inhib and then and and then you're inhibiting the pathway that inhibits the repressor. Yeah, it's tough, right? And um, so but all you have to remember is that when you add LY, which is the kinase inhibitor, uh, you're going to uh, be reactivating the virus, right. right? Okay, and that's how they use their system. So they infect, they get uh, latency, and then they can reactivate at different times, and then they can add interferon at different times and say what happened. Right. So that's they so Ly in fact um, causes reactivation as measured by green fluorescence and also infectious virus. If they add interferon beta or gamma, it reduces reactivation. So they've got these uh, they got these cultures in 96 well dishes and they infect all of them and then they just go in and visually assess how many of the wells turn green. Right. Okay? And in the controls you're getting about 20% of the wells turn green in a certain period of time. And the stimulation by LY is impressive. Mm-hmm. Okay? It goes up to 70% or something like that. So yep. that's that's real. And in fact, the the uh, effect of interferon knocking back that stimulation is also impressive. Yeah, both alpha, both beta or gamma interferon will inhibit reactivation in this. Now, case. there's an experiment that they didn't do that puzzles me. Mm-hmm. I would have put both interferons together. Really? <laughs> and asked See? if they had additive yeah. effects. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, because they bind different receptors. Yeah, that would be interesting to know. They also use, so LY is one inhibitor. There, there are other kinases in this pathway to 4-EBP1 and those inhibitors also reactivate. Okay, so that that makes sense. Now, the interferon, the activity of interferon goes through a receptor which uh, involves a protein kinase signaling pathway, and they inhibit the, the kinase in there, critical kinase in the interferon signaling pathway. And um, when they do that, the interferon no longer reduces reactivation. <laughs> Took me like... Ten minutes to figure out that sentence because there's so many negatives in it. <laughs> but if you inhibit the signaling by interferon, then it can no longer inhibit <laughs> reactivation, which right. is stimulated by the protein kinase inhibitor LY. Are we okay? Right. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. I wrote in the show Only notes on Thursdays. I, showed, I wrote in the show notes. Is it just me or is it hard to? No, I yeah. No, as a non-virologist reading that paper, it was filled. I'm sorry, with jargon. Dixon. I'm sorry, Dixon. With jargon. I mean, there are times when I re- I looked at a sentence and I'm sitting here this morning. Yeah. I look at a sentence five or six times and I'm thinking, why am I so stupid? Not stupid. I can't figure this out. <laughs> you don't live this material, so therefore it's not new, and it's yeah. Well, that's a key, and I I appreciate reading these for for Twiv because I get to learn stuff that I normally would not read at all, right. and this is what I've been doing for the past eight years, and. Uh, 
well, that's TWIV. <laughs> <laughs> Some are easier than others, though. I think it's helped our, our not only my our general right yeah, yeah. approach, but I bet it, it helps our research, those of us who do research. All right. Mm-hmm. So we have this system. You need to have signaling to maintain latency. We, we've shown that the inhibitor of signaling, LY, let's, uh, reactivates right. the virus. Okay. Now... Um, What's the next experiment? Okay, so then they look at 4-E-BP-1. Right, so the, que- so the question is, we've already talked about this pathway that yeah. is, that is uh, maintaining latency. The question is, is interferon just messing with that pathway, or is it doing something else? Right. So they, they do a blot looking at the phosphorylation state of 4-E-BP-1, which is... It's phosphorylated without any treatment in these neural neuron cultures. And then when you add LY, the inhibitor, it gets hypophosphorylated, less phosphate as you would expect because you're inhibiting the phosphorylation. All right. And interferon doesn't do anything more than that. Right. So that suggests that at least at that level, interferon is not messing with this same pattern. Right. It's not messing with the 4-EBP1 phosphorylation. Right. Right. The next thing is um, they look at the, the genes that are stimulated by interferon. I want to know if there's any difference here. Um, is this kinase that reactivates in, in influencing the abundance of various proteins that are stimulating by interferon? Okay. So they look at some of these proteins. They just look at a handful. Uh, they look at the protein and the transcripts. Um, they find that the levels are increased uh, in both untreated and LY-treated neurons. So LY is not having an effect on the interferon-stimulated protein or transcripts. Okay, so reactivation by interfering with this signaling uh, doesn't uh, interfere with the ISG accumulation in neurons. Okay, so that right. just rules that out, which is good. Uh, then, so so they've so far used LY, which is a chemical inhibitor of 4-EBP1. They say maybe it's not a good idea to use a chemical inhibitor. So they have a, a mutant of 4-EBP1, uh, which can't be phosphorylated, right? It's a, it's inducible uh, that constitutively represses 4-E. So basically it represses translation constitutively. Got it? They don't have to right. put a drug in anymore. So if they use that mutant, that should, if they just, uh, if they introduce that mutant form, that should induce Right. Uh, uh, reactivation, which it does. It does. They, uh, and they can and, induce it, as you say, so it's not there all the time. They can put it in the neuron cultures and then turn it on and then see what happens. Right. And, and uh, if you add interferons on top of that, you still repress right. uh, the reactivation, which means that even though you have this constitutively uh, active repressor there, interferon still uh, does the repression, which is further evidence that interferon is not exerting its effect through this pathway that goes from NGF through uh, PI3 kinase through 4-EBP1. Right. Uh, yes. okay? We're talking about a different pathway. Yeah, so I'm, I got tripped up because they used a different readout here for <laughs> reactivation, not green anymore. They used a late transcript. Right. Uh, as a readout, and in fact, yeah, so when you induce this uh, 4-EBP1 mutant, you get reactivation, and uh, interferon doesn't reverse that. This is like driving at night in unfamiliar territory. It's you okay. Can, you it's okay. Gotta, with your lights you got to be right on top of the steering wheel, <laughs> right? Just with your eyes absolutely glued on the road. The because if you look rolling. away for a second, you're over the cliff. Right. There you go. <laughs> All right. Now, um, when does this inhibition of interferon take place? Phase one. When in phase one? Is it? Could it do it in phase two? So they do some timing experiments. They put interferon on these cultures different times after the addition of LY, which reactivates infection. Okay, and then they look at transcripts, and they have markers for phase one and phase two. All right. So what happens is. Um, they can add, I'm going to give you the bottom line here. In, they can uh, interfere with phase one um, up to five to ten hours after the onset of reactivation. Okay, if you add interferon, it'll still block reactivation up to five to ten hours after the addition of LY, but can't do it by 20 hours. 
20 hours is too late. So you can interfere. The interferon works at the beginning of phase one and at the transition to phase two. But once you're in phase two, interferon doesn't work anymore. Right. You got it? You're rolling. Got it. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yep. So that's important because there's a window of opportunity. Once you're in phase two where you're starting to make proteins and replicating DNA, interferon is not going to help you. So if you start to think about what's happening in your neurons when you're in the reactivating, as soon as that phase one burst occurs, that's when your interferon, you know, produced by some other cell, has got to be made and, and has to work. And if the timing is off, you get a fever blister. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's it's kind of random in some ways, right? <laughs> I figure if you had a good meal, you make a good interferon response. <laughs> okay. Now, and, and I think Blue Apron can help with that. You know, what a tie-in. <laughs> that would be a good link to the ad. Especially if you use Blue Script for your, you know, well, whatever. So yeah. now, what's the impact of interferons on neuronal gene expression during reactivation? So now we know interferon can have an effect on reactivation when you're in phase one. What is it actually doing? What is interferon doing? We know that interferon turns on cellular genes. What is it doing in neurons specifically? So they do their reactivation uh, from latently infected cultures with or without interferon. They extract RNA in sequence, and they look for all the genes that are turned on. So we're looking at transcripts, right? And we kn- there are something like 437 genes that are responsive to interferon beta and gamma. 266 of these are turned on, and they see many genes that have known roles in antiviral defenses, like the famous one, STATS and ISG-15, IFIT-2, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, they're all turned on. But I think what's more interesting, they, they identify 36 genes that are up in neurons, 22 of which were not previously recognized as interferon-inducible, but apparently they are in this experiment. They're turned up by interferon. They could be, and this is cool, neuron-specific ISGs. Oh. And those, those might be ones that are important for interferon's ability to suppress reactivation as long as it's given in phase one. Okay? And that's obviously uh, for the future. They're probably working on it right now, right? Sure. But uh, we don't know how they work. But, you know, take each one by itself and try and figure out what it goes. So that's pretty cool. I like that. Uh, And so uh, of these genes, interferon beta and interferon gamma uh, turn on slightly different subsets. Okay, mm-hmm. but there's a significant amount of overlap. Okay, so right. they both turn on a lot of the same genes, 167 of them. Uh, but interferon gamma turns on another 261 that beta doesn't, wow. and interferon beta turns on another 90 that gamma doesn't. Okay, mm-hmm. so there's they're different sets, but they're overlapping. Right now, that's important for the next experiment. So the next idea is that okay, these phase one proteins, phase one, the phase one transcripts, transcripts. Trans was no proteins. No protein. Um, if they're involved in countering interferon, which ones are important? So they decided to produce a single viral protein and see if it can overcome the interferon block to reactivation. Remember, you treat with LY, you reactivate. If you have interferon present for the first five hours, you can block reactivation, which is good. So the interferon is protecting you. They chose ICP-0. It's a protein with a lot of different activities. I used to hear Saul talk about it all the time. Everybody got different results because it turns out the protein does different things. Uh, It stimulates viral gene expression. It antagonizes host antiviral defenses, including interferon signaling. So that's a good one. And it's required for reactivation from latency. Okay, so This is is one of the immediate early proteins that shows up during a normal lytic infection. It's a major regulator of the rest of the infection. So it's a logical candidate for looking at this. Mm-hmm. So they introduced this gene into neurons using adenovirus vectors. They put ICP-0 into adenovirus. They infect. They, they show that a lot of the neurons get uh, the, the expression. And in fact, this ICP-0 delivery to neurons reactivates on its own. 84% of the wells reactivate when you put ICP-0 in, so you don't even have to put LY in, okay? Interferon gamma does not protect against ICP-0-mediated reactivation. Cannot negate gamma antiviral action. But beta 
ICP-0 can't overcome beta action. So when you reactivate with ICP-0, you add beta, beta blocks reactivation, but not gamma. Right. You get about 40% reactivation mm -hmm. when you have the ICP-0 and the interferon beta. Right. So beta can do it, protect against zero reactivation, but not gamma. That's very interesting. Yeah, so with that gamma, says you have about 85%. Uh, reactivation with right. gamma and ICP zero. So, so they also so that that says that that says that those two interferons are potentially doing different, different things. Different things, right. right? Which is consistent with the transcription analysis showing that they uh, they induce, induce different genes, different right. subsets of genes with some overlap. Now, in contrast, they then delivered VP sixteen with adenovirus vector. All right, so it's a it's that protein that's delivered in the virus particle initially that's required for immediate early uh, transcription. Um, the cells remain sensitive to both beta and gamma. When, so VP16 cannot counter gamma as zero can. Both of them. So uh, they conclude a role for phase one protein in encountering defenses that would then allow you to go to phase two. So something made... Now, they say phase one protein, so I'm a little confused here. That's why, that's why but, I asked that question. They before, say originally phase one doesn't involve just translation. There's no proteins, but so, now there are proteins too. But here's the thing. Maybe in stress, you're going to... Um, translate some of those into proteins. You're going to translate some of them, and they're going to allow progression to phase Which two. Which ones? Wow, well, that's the question. Which ones? That would be the key here. How many? They're all there, so 80 of them. So you've got a lot of choices. <laughs> Ouch. Mm -hmm. So let's see if we can wrap this up in a in a way that <laughs> a <capsule>. summarizes. <laughs> so you get when you have reactivation, at least in this cell culture, with Rich's caveats, you have a limited window where interferon can prevent the progression to full reactivation. Okay. Um and they think that something in phase one is blocking transcription. And it's not probably it, it may not in so interferon doesn't antagonize uh by by fooling with the uh phosphorylation of 4-EBP, okay? So they think there must be some other target uh, of interferon action. They say it may maintain silencing of the lytic genes even when you have a reactivation stimulus. So maybe they do something to uh, the chromatin. I can imagine doing that, right? But um, I just wonder, they say interferon might a activate additional mechanisms of silencing that cannot be placed by phosphorylation cannot be displaced by phosphorylation. Remember, in the silenced herpes genome, phosphorylation of histones can turn it on. It can overcome the, the histone. Um, a, a neighboring. Yeah, the, modifi the lysine modification of neighboring histones. But right. they say maybe interferon um, can silence it, even in the presence of a phosphorylated residue. I, I just wonder what, though. So here, phase one transcripts are made. Um, if then, if you have a good interferon response, maybe you know a, a T cell is in the area and it makes interferon that then goes into the neuron, turns on interferon stimulated gene. Maybe there's some neuron specific ISGs that inhibit the progression from phase one to two. I could see that happening by modifying the chromatin further. Okay, but what happens when the interferon response isn't sufficient to prevent transition to phase two? They're arguing that a phase one protein is antagonizing the interferon, but how does it get transcribed? Is that part of the reactivation, that something gets transcribed and translated where it normally wouldn't be? You, you understand, uh, Rich, uh, Kathy? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I don't know what Seems the answer is. Seems possible, yeah. I don't know what the answer there. They say simultaneous expression of genes from all kinetic classes during phase one equips the reactivating virus with a broad tool set to defend against host antiviral responses. So there must be some proteins made under certain conditions. And I'm wondering if, um, yeah, I, I don't know what conditions uh, that would be. Although if tegument proteins are not present at the onset of reactivation, phase one viral genome-wide expression burst solves this problem by allowing proteins of all classes to accumulate. Yeah. So I, my question for the authors who may be listening is, if you think phase one proteins are antagonizing interferon, how are they made? Because you're telling us they're not. Or could it be that towards the end of phase one, they start to be translated? Ah, maybe that's it. Maybe towards the end of phase one, they're no longer translationally silent, right? Um, 
Now, does, could that involve 4EBP? So 4 EBP. I was wondering the same thing, except that they, well, uh, I was wondering the same thing, except that, of course, we've already shown that uh, this effective interferon apparently is independent of that particular pathway. So they should throw in some tracer molecules for protein synthesis and see when that starts. I, I would guess it starts at the end of phase one. The question is, mm -hmm. what is what is allowing protein synthesis to occur, and why is it repressed at the beginning of phase one? Um, because you need neuronal protein synthesis to keep the genome silent, transcriptionally right. silent. That's right. So why can't that then also translate the viral messages? So uh -oh. that that in, you know, I read a review article and I didn't get an answer to that. So that remained. But there are probably a lot of people out there who who know this, and so tell us. That's the one thing. So I think this is pretty cool that uh, you can, it's a neat system. You can see how interferon prevents reactivation and start to dissect out the details um, with it. I think it's cool. Right. Mm -hmm. And remember, stress is what in initiates uh, the reactivation. They actually talked about that a little. Let's see if we can bring something in there. Like how does stress... So stress is um, working through, oh, that was that paper we did last time. Remember, stress is working by leading to phosphorylation of the neighboring histones, right? And that's what turns on transcription, right? Remember that from the last right. uh, TWIV? Yep. And exactly how that happens, they didn't know, and, and I don't believe uh, we know here either. Okay. All right, that's enough of speculating and wondering out loud. I'm sorry if people don't like that. Listen. What do you mean? That's what that's, that's what we're how here science for. goes forward, yeah. not backwards. <laughs> yeah, it's cool. At some point, proteins have to be made. I'm looking at this. They have a cool figure, which summarizing it, figure five, right? Right. Reactivation from latency, viral episome, host factors. Uh, then we have phase one, viral mRNAs, and then they're getting some proteins made as you go into phase two. So at some point, you have to have translation, which we've said. I just want to know what gets those translated. Not initially, but later. That's it. Ian Moore, Angus, um, Wilson, Jessica Linderman, Mariko Kobayashi, etc. Let us know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they're they're saying here that uh, they're saying here that they think that some gene products from phase one mm -hmm. inhibit that interferon yeah, exactly. effect. Yeah, that's what I'm struggling does, with. Does does, the, does that have to be? I mean, could it be the RNAs? Uh, could it? Uh, is that what you're thinking? The transcript? Uh, well, no. I'm just thinking. Uh, could it be that? You know, basically, once you have enough, I'm uh, I'm ass I'm assuming that you're going to make some proteins. Okay? You have to eventually, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, but I I don't know that you necessarily have to have to suppress that pathway. Maybe you can do an end run end run on it, right? Mm. Uh, you know, maybe it's you, just enough mass action. You, a mass you just, action, something be, like that. I, 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 don't, I don't know that you necessarily the. I don't know that you necessarily have to specifically inhibit the pathway, but somehow get around it or overwhelm it. Uh, having having reactivated phase one, we'll see. Yep. Anyway, I thought it was a very interesting system. Now, you're right, Rich. It is in culture, and it's complicated. And be, but you have to have these yeah, reduction I, I, systems, right? Uh, you know, well, in bringing that up, I didn't mean to bash it at all. No, no. Right? I, I think it's, it just, was, it's important to it's important to understand that that this is a very difficult thing to to study either in an animal model or in culture. Uh, and sure. uh, there are several animal models. There are several uh, culture systems, and this is. The, this is a very good uh, uh, cultured model. It has to be, I, but I think it's important to understand that it is a model, okay, and that it is uh, in cell culture. But they have made such strides in understanding what's going on. Absolutely. I remember from grad, my grad student days where they really didn't know what was going on. Yeah. Well, and, and one of the things <laughs> is, you know, you can, say, you can say, well, this reactivation, if I understand it correctly, this phased reactivation has only been uh, observed in culture, but that that this is what models do they among other things raise questions they mm. say wow is that yeah, yeah. what actually happens in an animal and it inspires experiments to look in other models and 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 find out if that's really what's yeah. happening yep okay dixon yep are you well yes right, let's do a few emails okay esper writes dear vincent greetings from sunny brazil i hope this message finds you and the twiv colleagues well an amazing story unfolded 
during the yellow fever outbreak in Brazil, which we talked about not too long ago. It was brought up by Natalia Cancian, a health-specialized reporter working in the main Brazilian daily newspaper, Folha de São Paulo, and he gives a link to this article. Bottom line is, this is a small rural town, Franciscopolis, population 5,708 inhabitants, has a nurse in charge of public health surveillance, Kenya Moreira. When some citizens started reporting the death of an unusual number of macaques, she immediately tried to send some carcasses for analyses, but they were considered inappropriate due to the long time after the animal's death. She did not wait. She requested more yellow fever vaccine doses and expanded the immunization for those who were susceptible around town. Now look at the map of cases for the region. And he has a map here where you have Francisopolis in the middle and the surrounding uh, areas, uh, towns, I presume. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. And Rans- Francisopolis is white and the others are all red. No cases. And then he says it gives us a graph of the number of cases per city by February 13th and the surrounding Cities, zero. 105, 50, 35, et cetera. Francisopolis has zero. Right. Yes, vaccination can prevent yellow fever transmission. <laughs> it is unquestionable how the Brazilian authorities fell short of providing the same type of simple intervention to prevent such a disastrous outbreak. Terrible using a modern Twitter jargon. <laughs> we should show this to all the anti vax morons that are still out there and perhaps suggest they visit the region. Right. Well, the best <laughs> Esper. That's wonderful. Yeah, that's a really great example. <laughs> mm-hmm. And good for her for make, putting yeah. two and two together. Really? Yeah. I'm a little surprised at the Brazilian government because the Brazilians are usually pretty much on top of this kind of stuff. They're really, they're really um, you know, on the crest of the wave when it comes to vaccination. They, you know, they invented uh, vaccination days and that kind of stuff. Yeah. They've, they've done really well. Uh, Kathy, can you take the next one, please? Sure. Hannah writes, Hello, Twivers. I'm a biochemistry student at Skidmore College, where it's 30 degrees Fahrenheit, minus one Celsius, and there's about a foot of snow. (laughs) So that was a while back. (laughs) This semester, I'm taking a virology course, and I've been finding it and your podcast very interesting. I'm in the process of writing an end-of-term paper on HIV, and I was wondering if any particularly intriguing papers or insights on the virus came to mind. Thanks for great Sunday entertainment. Mm -mm. And I had just sent Vincent a paper that Beth Moore presented to our class in our short or before class starts virus in the news segment uh, about HIV entitled Mucosal Stromal Fibroblasts Markedly Enhance HIV Infection of CD4 Positive T Cells. And uh, so we can get, put yeah, that it's reference good in. It's it's a really cool finding. It's, it explains how there's better transmission of HIV when there's tears in the mucosal layer. And basically the fibroblasts don't get infected, but they somehow help convey the virus. Uh, So it's, it's a really remarkable study. By the way, uh, Hannah's email came in on February 18th, not too long ago. Okay. So it's upstate New York. Apparently it's cold up there still. Maybe not now. No. We're missing our reporter from uh, Western Mich- uh, Massachusetts. Right. Dixon, can you take okay. Yosef's? Yosef writes, Dear Twiv team. <clears throat> Hello, team. Even though I'm a Twiv veteran, I Twip, do... Li- Twip. Oh. Let me restate That's why I'm letting this. you read this. <laughs> Even though I am a Twip veteran, I do listen to all your podcasts. I'll, I'll try it slower. Like reading the titles of papers. <laughs> <clears throat> In Twiv... 428, Vincent mentioned that we might be better off if we didn't have amygdalas. I would like to point to kluver bucy syndrome, which is caused by damage to both amygdalas, to see what your opinion would be. Symptoms are, one, amnesia. Makes sense considering the strength of memories can be tied to their emotional connections. Two, docility, including decreased fear response. Three, hyperphagia. Includes e- eating of strange foods, i.e. pica. Heteroral. N- hyperorality. N- hyperorality. Hyper-orality. Oh, hyperorality. Got it. Examination of objects by mouth. I imagine it is very much like how children act. Hypersexuality. Including with inanimate objects and those of other species. Hmm. Um, six. Visual 
agnosia, loss of the ability to recognize objects or people. There is a Radiolab episode exploring a man diagnosed with Kluver-Bushi syndrome that can be found here. It's called Blame. Sincerely, Yosef. Okay, I'll keep my amygdala. Would you? Yeah. yeah. Both of them? Yeah. Both. <laughs> yeah. Now, Yosef is a medical student out at Hofstra, right? That's right. Or no- Hofstra Northwell Medical School. He That's writes correct. the TWIP all the time. He yeah. does. He does. He does. Okay. Does. Very good. Uh, Rich. Miriam writes, Dear Vincent and all the lovely TWIV team, <laughs> my name is Miriam Afabi. I think you know me from Instagram. I'm the one who enjoys to make origami viruses. Oh. I wanted to write an email way sooner than now because, you know, I love you guys. <laughs> and I wanted to thank you for all the things you do for us for the virology world. You cannot believe how much I enjoy listening to your podcast. And believe me, I become more interested in virology every week because of you. Nice. Let me introduce myself a little more. I am a first-year MSc medical virology student in Golestan University of Medical Science. That's in Gorgon, Iran. Hmm. And I'm your listener since TWIV 368. I first found you when I was searching for virology in my iPad's podcast app. At that time, I wasn't sure what I wanted to do with my life, and I was about to make a bad decision, but you guys (laughs) saved me. It's a long story, so I won't take your time, but I will write it in another email, and so you can read it later if you could. I must say, last year was full of miracles for me, and finding you was one of the greatest ones. I don't know how to thank you more. Whatever I do, I can't thank you enough. Love you all with a big heart. (laughs) <laughs> P.S. Sorry for the bad grammar. It's my first English email, actually. I know I should take some English courses. P.P.S. I would like to be a cool and good virologist like you, and I promise that I'll do my best. <laughs> P.P.P.S. I almost forgot. The weather here in Gorgon, a northern city in Iran, yeah, right. is 4 degrees C, and it's a clear moonlight sky. I can see the stars. Thank you. Love to you all. Miriam. What a wonderful letter. <laughs> Let's clone wow. that. Uh, we are so grateful for that, and I'm so glad uh, you benefit from this, and your English is great. It Don't is. Worry yeah. about it. Don't very worry good. about it for a minute. It is. It really Don't is waste great. your time. Take virology classes. No, go work in a lab. Don't worry about it. <laughs> courses. You're fine. Uh, Don't take any more classes. Just go wash dishes somewhere. So I have two <laughs> thoughts here. First, yes, uh, Mary M follows me on Inst- Instagram, and she, the other day, she put a picture of a paper in, uh, icosahedron that she made, so that was cool. <laughs> Secondly, I'm very curious. I don't think anyone from Iran has ever written to I'm us. I'm not so sure. You I think? think we may have had Iran letters before. Really? Anyway, I'm, I'm really glad to hear from someone there, and I'm glad to hear from you. And what's it like to be a student there? Can you, mm. is there, can you study whatever you want? Give us some sense of what life is like there because yeah. you know here we don't hear much we honest. hear mostly negative things yeah, yeah and i bad. and obviously you are a wonderful person and i'll bet there are lots of wonderful people there i'd love there to are, hear more about what uh what you can do you know if you go through this msc program what are you going to do we're curious right and plus well, you can listen to 12 that's good <laughs> yeah, that's good uh should we uh, stop here and do two picks do you think i Based on the next letter, yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's fine. Because um, it is a bit long, but yeah, give the list, give the listeners a break. They've been doing two hours for weeks now. That's this right. will be a little less. That's right. uh, Rich Condit. Do you have a pick of the week? I do. So um, this is a little uh, different than normal, but we'll go with it. We have normal. Um, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> you got to be so, joking. <laughs> we talk about a lot of nasty stuff on this show we talk a lot about viruses that really cause nasty diseases and cause a lot of suffering and we you know talk about other stuff too i mean we talk about autism we talk about chronic fatigue syndrome other things and i think uh i think we're actually pretty sensitive to um the suffering that people experience with this but you know at the same time we'll talk about these things as interesting uh vincent you related recently either in the last podcast or in a blog getting bashed by a student for referring to hiv as cool right (laughs) um and uh i've had an encounter recently that just inspires me to send out sort of a 
uh, uh, compassionate message to the people who uh, are on the uh, receiving end of a lot of this stuff and what they uh, have to deal with. Um, so um, this comes in the form. Okay. So uh, <laughs> probably implied in the past, but never strictly stated is that I'm a um, uh, sometimes casual, sometimes less than casual student of uh, Buddhist philosophy. And people uh, interested in this sort of stuff uh, tend to gather in groups that in the uh, Buddhist lexicon are called sanghas, groups of like-minded individuals to share meditation and and um, uh, insights or education into uh, Buddhist philosophy. And a lot of what Buddhism uh, is about, mostly but what it's about, is how to deal with all of the crazy and sometimes miserable stuff that's going on in your head. Uh, and so we've, you know... Uh, started interacting with a group uh, here in Austin, a small group uh, nearby that uh, meets on a regular basis. And I met uh, a woman who's part of this group named Angela, whose uh, daughter has a syndrome called Drabbit syndrome. Drabbit syndrome, and of course, at one point, and we were actually at a party, we got into a big conversation about this and all the genetics, and it's, you know, it's interesting. Um, it's a, um, a frame shift mutation in a chloride ion transporter that's prominent in the brain that results in uh, basically uh, a lot of seizures. These kids can have hundreds of seizures in a month some of them minor, some of them more major. Um, and it causes behavioral defects and uh, behavioral de delayed development as well. And it sounds like just an absolutely miserable thing to deal with. It's a spontaneous uh, mutation. It's, uh, it's uh, the way I figure it, it's, it's obviously dominant. This just shows up in one, one in something like 20 or 30,000 uh, births. Um, and so it's not inherited. It just shows up, uh, either because of, I suppose, an egg or a sperm, uh, or a zygote that experienced this, uh, mutation. Um, I presume that one of the reasons it's not inherited is that the people affected by this disorder, uh, very seldom, um, uh, pass it on. Okay. Because of the, because of the disease itself. At any rate, the re the way that uh, Angela, she's a pediatrician, by the way, and so we can talk the science, and she understands all the science behind uh, uh, her daughter's uh, uh, problem. Uh, and, of course, this is a, a real hardship for her, and the way she deals with it is um, in part uh, uh, through the practice of uh, studies of Buddhist philosophy, practices of uh, meditation, and et cetera. And she writes a blog about how that helps her co cope. So that's my pick is the blog. It's called Vipassana Mama. And Vipassana is the style of meditation that she engages in. And one of the reasons I wanted to do this now, I talked to her last night, and she just uh, uh, put up a new post uh, on this blog. She doesn't have a lot of posts on it because obviously she's got a lot to do. Um, but she put up a new post inspired to some extent by the fact that uh, her child, she was hoping, would be able to be enrolled in a new trial for a drug that looks like it has some promise in controlling uh, some of the symptoms. But because of a, a minor uh, heart valve uh, issue that was discovered in her daughter, she was included for the trial. So that was uh, tough for her. Um, and in this blog, she talks about, you know, one of the ways, uh, one of the Buddhist teachings that helps you deal with this. Uh, a big deal in Buddhism is impermanence. Everything is changing all the time. And what that means is that you can't be certain of anything. And this is very, very difficult to deal with. And she points out in an early blog, you know, I thought my life was just going to be great. And then all of a sudden this uh, happened. So, you know, what next? And this is a really nice blog about how to deal with uncertainty and, mm -hmm. um, and, um, uh, and it's, you know, effects on your head. And 
bringing it around to the science again, she has a number of really cool quotes in here, including one from Richard Feynman, hmm. um, who was a Nobel Prize winning uh, physicist on uncertainty. And I want to read this. I love, I love Feynman. He's just terrific. I can live, uh, here's his quote, I can live with doubt and uncertainty and not knowing. I think it is much more interesting to live not knowing than to have answers that might be wrong. <laughs> if we will only allow that as we progress, we remain unsure, we will, have, uh, we will leave opportunities for alternatives. We will not become enthusiastic for fact, the knowledge, the absolute truth of the day, but always remain uncertain. In order to make progress, we must leave the door to the unknown ajar. So here's a shout out to Angela and all other people in her situation. We get it. Boy, that seems like a yeah. good candidate for gene therapy. You would think. I mean, has anyone, uh, has anyone got a trial for that? Is anyone don't working know. on it? I mean, Angela would know. I mean, one of the things that she talks about in this blog is, of course, in this sort of situation, you become involved yeah, in, sure. in the societies that deal with this. And uh, so that's uh, part of what she has done. On this particular blog, she's got a... This is very recently described. She's got a picture of herself with her daughter and uh, Charlotte Dravet, who's a French scientist who first uh, described the syndrome and I believe did the genetics. I'm not sure. Mm. She says the daughter's up to 100 seizures a month. Oh, man. To hear her describe what she has to deal That's with is just, is just something. Okay? Wow. And she's, you know, she's, she's one person. There are yeah, people out there all over the place who are dealing with all of these miserable things that we talk about. So yeah. here's to you. You bet. Wow. Now, she does have a New Yorker cartoon in here. There's a picture of a car on a highway, nothing around, and there's a billboard that says, your own tedious thoughts next 200 miles. Right. <laughs> 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 yep. She writes very well about the sort of the integration of, you know, how the Buddhist philosophy can help uh, deal with this kind of stuff. Cause as I said, it's yeah. all about, it's all about understanding how your head works and trying to uh, use that understanding to deal with these sorts of yeah. troubles. Thank you. Yep. Mm -hmm. Dixon. Vincent. I have a fantastic pick. In fact, it's one that I've looked at three times already. Um, <laughs> it's a Nova show that just came out. It's called, uh, origami revolution. And, um, it touches all the bases, I would say. You know, I think of origami as like paper airplanes, and then it goes to little animals, and then you see the Christmas tree at the American Museum of Natural History with all the origami animals on it. And you think, yeah, that's kind of a nice thing. It's sort of like a bingo club, you know, people get together and they say, oh, I can fold an elephant and I can fold a. Well, <clears throat> it's nothing like that at all. <laughs> it's like all of the things that you ever wanted to know about creating three-dimensional objects out of two-dimensional objects. Mm. And from a simple piece of paper and mathematics, you can recreate the world. That's exactly what it says. There's virology in there. There's protein chemistry in there. There's designer proteins to interfere with virus synthesis in there. There's how to make a black widow spider from a two-dimensional piece of paper. And, you know, my mind has just gone crazy with this. If you want to live in Mars... The simplest way is to, to take advantage of this technology and, and ship flat sheets of everything and then assemble them when you get there. And, <laughs> mm -hmm. and not kidding. I mean, I think that yeah. could work out very well. I don't know, Kathy, have you seen this or Richard? Did you see that Nova show? I just uh, watched no, I the didn't. first minute I, of it this morning and I'm totally hooked. I, yeah, I it looks watch great. the rest. Yeah. It says, you know, it says, it gives you a, a question. The question is, how does six feet worth of DNA fit into the size of a nucleus? Ah, folding. Absolutely. Yes, of course. And then you've got the same problems with viral genomes. You've got the same that problem right with... right in front of you there. No, I got it. See? I, you see? This? You know what, Look. Vincent? I got it. No, you don't. You don't. Because it's I right do in front it. of you. Why bother with a nucleus when you have a virus? <laughs> <laughs> well, the capsid and the virus and the and genome is a little bit like the same stuff, right? So yeah. you're, you miniaturize and then you try to envision. And there is a mathematics to this. And so these two mathematicians that explain how they do things makes it extremely clear, and yet at the same time, there's still mystery. Yep. Yep. I had a great time. I, I think the, the folding of the paper is great, and then they go to biological things, yeah. and they had 
a bat unfolding yes. its wings. Yeah. With and then a big mm-hmm. beetle. A beetle mm-hmm. there too. Yeah, yeah. exactly. It's pretty right. cool. It, it was flowers, fantastic. flowers, flowers, yeah. and then leaves. Mm-hmm. You know, nature packages. So biomimicry, basically, origami is an extension of biomimicry that we didn't even know until we yeah, discovered no, I, the natural equipment. I like a video like that where they make parallels and be smart about it. It takes a little creativity, but in the end, it's yeah. really good. Yeah, and Nova does such a good job with these anyway. I, I, I watch them all. They're fantastic. Kathy, that Yahoo News. <laughs> yeah, I know you watch what, Yahoo News. That's your source. Kathy, what do you have? I have something that's just a short little thing to go do online at this site. It's called Landlines Chrome Experiments. And mm-hmm. there's two <laughs> modes to it. One is draw and one is drag. And draw, <laughs> you just draw a little shape and then it and then it'll find some aerial picture that has that shape in it or sometimes oh. something not quite like that shape. And then the other one is called drag and you just start moving your mouse, and then you end up dragging through <laughs> one photo after another. It's very cool. It's just, Love it. You know, it's there's not very much to it. You don't do it for very long, but every time I come back to it, it's <laughs> just somehow kind of soothing. Soothing. That's a good yeah. word. That's a good and word. I notice sometimes it does, it finds patterns like a field or a, an, a runway of an airport, and sometimes it doesn't. It can't match. Right. I try and trick it and match, draw things that I can't find in nature. Right. <laughs> Interesting. right. But these are all aerial photos, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's very so I think cool. we've I think we've talked about this before that uh, if you work for Google, you're encouraged to spend I think it's up to something like twenty percent mm. of your time just mm. playing, go- goofing off in a Google way. So this yeah, is great. the kind of stuff that happens, and who knows. I mean, we talk about – actually, that's one thing I'm going to talk about when I do this book and stuff. This is <laughs> – it, 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 it's like uh, not restricting what people do in their research. This is serendipity. This is, you know, messing around. This is where the discoveries come from. Right. Yeah. Uh, my pick is a Times article by Joanna Klein called Hunched Over a Microscope, He Sketched the Secrets of How the Brain Works. This is awesome. <laughs> this is, I think, science writing at its best. You know, it doesn't try to explain too much because otherwise it gets into trouble because the writer may not have the right expertise. But here it's talking about this wonderful Santiago Ramon y Cajal, the well-known Nobel laureate for the brain who figured out how the father of modern neuroscience, let's say. And I believe a book has just uh, come out about him, the beautiful brain drawings of of uh, Ramon y Cajal, and this is an article, and it's got this, these one some of his wonderful sketches of the uh, structure of the brain and nerves. I love the picture of him in his laboratory. And him in his lab, that's the best. That's what caught me. He's awesome sitting there, and uh, he's got stains all over the place. He's wearing a <laughs> some kind of a smock, and uh, he's got a couple of microscopes and lots and lots of bottles there. And he's got this look. He's looking right at you, yeah. and it's very cool. It's a great article, and it talks about how he got interested in, you know, how did nerve impulses travel through the brain. He made observations. He did a lot of staining, and uh, he and Golgi in 1906 shared the Nobel Prize because Golgi uh, told him about his stain that he had developed, mm-hmm. and then he refined it and made better images and, and did it. Anyway. That's a silver is, stain, isn't it? I don't know what it is. I guess so. It is. I think it is. So uh, uh, there's a traveling exhibit of this stuff that's going like to make it, it yeah. into New York. Um, it's uh, let me see. It'll stop in. It opened in Minneapolis, uh, and it'll stop in Vancouver, New York City, Cambridge, Chapel Hill cool. through April 2019. Wow, you know that's worth a trip. By the way, there's a I wonder weird- if I can catch that in either New York or in. Uh, uh, Cambridge. There's a weird connection here too between what I picked and what you picked, because there's a a, a vignette in a lab, I believe it's at MIT, where they take a gelatin and attach some other gel on top of it, and it looks as though it's a perfectly round, smooth surface. Mm-hmm. The outer gelatin grows, but the inner one keeps it from expanding underneath, and what you get is a pattern that looks very much like the surface hmm. of your brain. Hmm. So it's a folding. Was, there was a there was a segment of that video where someone was yes, fold, was yes. feeling a brain. Yeah, that's yeah, right. right. That's 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 mm-hmm. that's this. All the uh, 
the convolutions of your brain fits into your skull because it develops it yeah. can't go any yeah. further right so it has to keep folding in on itself so they have some of his drawings in this article and they note that some of them resembled the work of other artists um and like Vincent van Gogh and they have one here where he drew the cortex of a man who suffered from paralysis and three nuclei in the upper left corner resembled mm-hmm. the scream yeah yes. <laughs> it's really cool and he must really have great. he must it's have had techniques much. for staining individual uh neurons i guess mm-hmm. cuz this uh huh. this you know some of the pictures of the individual neurons are just amazing yeah well, well Dixon, so, maybe, maybe we should go to this exhibit, Dixon. Maybe. Absolutely. Yeah. Maybe. I wouldn't miss that. definitely go to it. January 9th to March 31st, 2018. Oh, there's the schedule. So, yeah, where is it I again? Where is it page. being held in New York? Uh, NYU, Gray Art Gallery. Got it. The Gray Matter Art Gallery. <laughs> <laughs> and then from May 2018 to January 2019, it'll be at the MIT Museum. Got and I'll, you can go I, to this. One way or another, I'll get there. Yeah, I'm going yeah. to NYU on Tuesday to teach. Maybe I should just right. stop by and look. No, no, up. it's a year from now. <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> 2018. You have to, go to, you have to, to get go into to your time machine to get there. 2018. Right. Wow, it's a year There'll from now. There'll be something now. else in the New York Times when it opens there, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. Oh, my gosh. It's a long time. It is, actually. Scary, too. All right. Well, with that, that's uh, TWIV 430. You can find it at iTunes at microbe.tv slash twiv or on your smartphone or tablet using your favorite podcatcher. You can subscribe for free and get all the episodes. Why don't you go do that and tell your friends and their friends and so on and so on. Twiv at microbe.tv is where you send your questions and comments. Now, you know, this uh, book contest is almost over. We're very close to 27. But don't let that... Inhibit you. Just try. Vincent has many more books. I have a lot of other books, too. You know, but I can't get to the next one, because if I overlap, that would be tragic, right? Um, it should <laughs> be, be tragic. confusing. Be confusing, not tragic. Also, consider supporting our shows. Help us to do all kinds of things like traveling and think up new things to do and so forth. We're going to all go to ASV. Microbe.tv slash contribute. We have Patreon. We have PayPal. We have Amazon affiliate account. So just go over there. You can give a buck a month. That would be great. Uh, We would really appreciate it. Dixon de Palmier is at thelivingriver.org and parasiteswithoutborders.com. Thank you, Dixon. You're welcome, Vincent. Kathy Spindler is at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Thank you, Kathy. Thanks. This is a lot of fun. Rich Condit is a former emeritus, no, he's he's an emeritus professor at the University of Florida in Gainesville. Now he's in Austin, Texas. Would you believe it? Sure (laughs) enough, yeah. (laughs) Always a a good time. There's a big podcaster in Austin. Uh, Yeah, I think I had a conversation conversation. with this guy a long time ago. Yeah, because he does Buddhism Buddhism as well. Uh, uh, Twiv types are sort of... um, uh, surfacing all around me. I'm going to have uh, a <laughs> lunch with another guy, uh, another Twiv fan in, uh, in a couple of weeks. And then of course there's Neva. And, uh, actually I got this woman I spoke of in my pick, by the way, that's, I think I miss, uh, pronounced this cause it's French. It's probably Dravet syndrome. Mm-hmm. At any rate, um, she's been listening to Twiv. So hmm. we, I think we, I think we have a lot of, uh, fans in, in Austin, Texas. Yeah. Which I was looking at on a map that I had drawn a few episodes ago, and I would say it's on the southeastern <laughs> part because it's yeah. really close That'd to uh, the war- not close to the, but it's down there, you know, southeastern, southeastern Texas. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology ws. I'd like to thank the sponsor of this episode, Blue Apron. You've been listening to this week in virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. <laughs>